a professor of psychology here at KU, and I serve as the convener of the uh, Council of Distinguished Professors uh, at KU. I want to thank you all for coming today, for taking time from your families and from your yard work, though maybe in the rain that <laughs> was not going to be what you're going to do, and for from updating your Facebook pages, something I know you're all desperate to get back to. We've all had one of those experiences where the email we sent to reply all by mistake, the Twitter post we thought was funny but some found offensive, the unflattering photo we thought we had deleted from Facebook, the chain of pop-up ads that follow us forever after a spell of web surfing while waiting on a delayed flight. The news is filled with stories of cyberbullying, sexting, distract, distracted driving, and a daughter's insensitive tweet that cost her father $80,000 by violating a non-disclosure agreement, and a teenager's prank Twitter impersonating a terrorist that landed her in jail. Snowden has warned us about the dark arts in the digital realm and internet addiction may find its way into the next edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. Meanwhile, the State Department is trolling, another new word, jihadists. Turkey has banned YouTube, and Senator Ted Cruz has found that his followers on Facebook actually do support Obamacare. Master satirist Stephen Colbert was the victim of a malicious tweet that offended many, and uh, hashtag fake Jeff Withy has a loyal Twitter following at the University of Kentucky. As faculty members, we have an obligation to engage in scholarly inquiry and the right as well as the obligation to speak out, to use our professional training and expertise for civic engagement, scientific advancement, and scholarly commentary. Yet, whether we are blogging, tweeting, or posting on climate change, stay-at-home moms versus working moms, the NSA or the NRA, we are monitored by advocacy groups, vigilantes, watchdogs, activists, and campaigners of all political, religious, and ethical persuasions. We are monitored online and offline, in print and in pixels, in the classroom, on websites, and in emails. And so we find ourselves today in a new era, the era of social media, grappling with the implications of the World Wide Web, cell phone cameras in the classroom, and Google Glass. It is an era in which we have embraced social media for recruiting students, promoting our research, and tracking alumni, but it is also an era in which 140 characters that include the hashtag NRA can unleash a firestorm of responses. And unfortunately, it is an era in which the Kansas Board of Regents was recognized by a Thomas Jefferson Center for Pr the Protection of Free Expression with a Jefferson Muzzle Award. The Joint Council of Kansas Distinguished Professors was established um, to discuss issues concerned with the improvement and promotion of research and scholarly excellence at KU, KSU, and WSU. Um, given our leadership roles within the scholarly community, it seemed only fitting that distinguished professors also work together as an unofficial group of advisors to our campus colleagues and to the state policymakers. Periodically, we have met to explore ways to advance research and scholarship to help guide the state's higher education policies and encourage ongoing investment in the three research universities of Kansas. No issue affecting our universities is more critical than the one we address today, academic freedom and responsibility in the era of social media. This uh, symposium was organized to promote discussion and no doubt debate about the meaning and implications of academic freedom and responsibility in the era of Twitter, Facebook, Yelp, Pinterest, StumbleUpon, YouTube, Blogger, Foursquare, LinkedIn, Instagram, Flickr, MySpace, Reddit, WikiLeaks, Mashups, and whatever else has sprung up in the last 15 minutes. We are streaming live from journalism.ku.edu slash crossroads, 
We will be uploaded to YouTube so you can replay this discussion over and over again, <laughs> sharing it with your friends, neighbors, and grandchildren. And you are invited to tweet your comments to hashtag free speech KS. There should be ample time for tweeting and blogging and for actual face-to-face -face discussion. Our first panel will provide some uh, historical and contemporary background. And after a break, and I hope they bring refreshments, which they were supposed to bring by now, um, our second panel will share with us some innovative ways to use social media as well as threats to those uses. And I hope you will be able to stay for the final discussion on how do we move forward in this era of social media to protect uh, academic freedom. I first want to introduce uh, Provost and Executive Vice Chancellor Jeff uh, Vitter. I do want to note that the Provost is also the Roy A. Roberts Distinguished Professor of Computer Science. I, too, am a Roy A. Roberts Distinguished Professor, but my appointment's in psychology. I mention this because it seems rather appropriate to remember Roy A. Roberts on this occasion. Roberts dropped out of KU only to join the staff of the Kansas City Star, eventually becoming president, editor, and general manager. In the 1940s and 1950s, he used the power of the social media of his day to bring down the Pendergrass a political machine that ruled Kansas City. In a 1968 speech at Rockhurst College, he pointed out every institution in America today is either adapting to change or is in trouble or both. For we are changing the world faster than we change ourselves. I think that was true in 1968 and it is still true today. Jeff. Thank you, Susan, and thank everyone for being here today. I want to welcome all of our colleagues from, of course, KU, but K-State, Wichita State, as well as from, uh, I think there are folks perhaps from Emporia State and Wichita State, or uh, Pittsburgh State, um, as well as uh, Fort Hayes. Uh, this is going to be a great discussion, and it's a very, very timely topic, of course. Um, I originally planned to try to lighten up things a little bit with a, a few jokes, but uh, actually everything got redacted and marked out, so um, I, you know, I guess even provosts have issues with free speech, uh, although those of you who have heard uh, some of my jokes in the past will probably be happy that my staff took the liberty to <laughs> scratch those out. Uh, all joking aside, I want to commend the distinguished professors especially for taking the lead on examining this very, very important topic that's at the center to our university life uh, of social media and the policies for its use all around this issue, fundamental issue of academic freedom and freedom of speech. At lesser institutions, faculty might shrink back and be afraid from addressing this particular issue. But not here. Here in Kansas, Kansans are taking the lead in addressing this issue. And I want to especially compliment the working group, of course, as well as the distinguished professors. Um, they met frequently, diligently, and really did a remarkable job at formulating a well-reasoned, balanced policy that not only first of all, affirms the paramount importance of academic freedom and freedom of speech, but also in a balanced way that recognizes the responsibilities inherent in its use. So let me especially thank KU Professor Chuck Epp for his tireless service, as along with co-chair Kevin Johnson, and the entire committee for appearing before the board, doing all their work. They presented the revision a few weeks ago, and um, I think we all owe them a hearty round of applause for that work. Uh, we actually had a meeting of the Faculty Senate um, on Thursday here at KU, and I, I think it's without question that this report, the working group revision, 
got extremely uniform accolades all across Kansas. In fact, at that Senate meeting, it was described as the most praised and respected report that was ever considered in this university. Uh, apparently, my two recent reports got bumped <laughs> down to second and third place. Um, but um, let, me, let me say a little bit about where we are now. Uh, Fred Logan visited campus two days ago. Uh, it was part of his visit to all the campuses at KU. It just happened to be that the KU visit was exactly in the middle of all of this discussion, so you can imagine what the main topic was at that meeting. And we're, we're going to see probably this coming week the Board of, Regents, Board of Regents revisions to the social media policy as a result of the revisions that were presented to them a few weeks ago. And they're going to be out for public comment, which I think is a very positive thing. Um, I think clearly the overwhelming majority of people in universities would have preferred to see that working group report. And we will have to wait and see how the revisions come out. It's very, very heartening to hear that a large part of the language, uh, much of the verbiage that was in the working group report will be present in the revisions. And I think it's important to keep in mind, and I want to emphasize, that uh, the Board of Regents is being very purposeful in working to, frankly, protect the universities, KU, but all of the universities, uh, and they're doing this with the best of intentions, so as to assist universities in building a trustful relationship with the legislature in Kansas, to build that, that kind of uh, working relationship that will secure strong support for higher education going into the future. And that brings me back to this question of leadership. You know, taking a leadership role is befitting major public international research universities. And issues of freedom of speech in this age of social media are very deep and very complex. Um, and rather than shy away, we have the opportunity to be national leaders in examining these very complex issues, uh, the nuances of these particular um, concerns that arise, and in so doing, emphasize the tremendous intellectual discovery that's going on at all of our institutions. A good example of that is the March 25th panel that was held right across the street in the Commons. Uh, if you haven't been, a if you were not able to attend or haven't been able to hear it already, I urge you to go to the Commons website. You can watch the video. It is truly a stellar presentation by national experts and the discussion was extremely, I think, enlightening as well and it sets the stage for a lot of these particular issues. Today is another opportunity for advancing and highlighting our intellectual vibrancy as evidenced by how we investigate this particular issue. And taken together, whether you, whether you consider today's events or the Commons discussion on March 25th, or the actions of the working group and their deliberations over the last few months, there's no doubt that we as Kansans are invigorated by these issues, that we do not shy away from an important national conversation, and more importantly of all, we're leaders in advancing the public discourse and raising the consciousness of this important issue. So thank you for being here today and advancing that conversation and bringing visibility to why we at Kansas have all so much to be proud of, and this is just one example of how we are examining from an intellectual point of view an important issue that's going to be facing the entire nation. So thank you for being here. Rock chalk and go wildcats, shockers, hornets, <laughs> gorillas, tigers, and J-Docs. Thanks. <laughs> So, let me introduce Phil now. Phil made the journey over from K-State uh, this morning. Uh, he will be uh, 
sharing his own views a bit later, but he's going to introduce our first set of speakers. Good afternoon. I will just uh, give names and titles and the title of the talk, and that's about all I'm going to do for, for introductions. Um, first, we have Mabel L. Rice, who is Merrill Distinguished Professor of Speech, Language, and Hearing here at KU, and she will speak to us about serving the public tradition of a public research university. I hope you'll forgive me, but I have changed my title. Um, to talk about academic freedom in public universities following the legacy of the Founding Fathers, we're going to step back a little bit uh, as we move into this topic away from the contemporary world of social media into uh, the world of the public universities and the legacy of the Founding Fathers and their support for the notion of public universities and how this bears on our topic of today. Public universities, we are here in the great Midwest. We live with these institutions and we sort of take them as a given. On the other hand, it is important to step back and realize a little bit that our public universities are a great American institution that turns out to have a great economic impact and a great uh, power in defining the policies of education, not only in this country, but internationally as well. So we are one of 235 public research universities, land-grant institutions, state university systems. Uh, this enterprise uh, has 4.7 million, a little shy than 5 million undergraduates. A uh, little more than a million graduate students uh, uh, disseminates, awards more than a million degrees on an annual basis, and employs more than a million faculty and staff. Also, this enterprise conducts $41 billion in university-based research. These uh, statistics are coming from the website of the Association of Public and Land-Grant Universities. So we might think that this is a humble operation, but in fact it is not. It is a driver of educational standards nationally and internationally and one that we should take ownership of and take quite seriously in our role as a participant in this grand exercise. This public university initiative had some well-known historical benchmarks. The first public universities universities in the U.S., well, in the way of data analytics, it turns out to be uh, not straightforward. It depends upon how you define first. The University of Georgia can claim priority as being the first chartered by the state in 1785, and it opened in 1801. The University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill also takes precedence as being first. It was chartered in 1789 and opened in 1795, so it was the first public university to be opened. The College of William and Mary was founded by Royal Charter in 1693 and accepted public funding from the Commonwealth of Virginia in 1906. So depending upon how you look at it, our historical roots begin in 1693 or in 1785 or in 1795. Close on, I want to draw attention to the University of Virginia that was founded in 1819 by Thomas Jefferson because we are going to return to his leadership here. Moving into our region, the first public universities west of the Mississippi are the great University of Missouri, 1839, the University of Kansas, 1854, Kansas State University, 1863, we'll talk about the timing of that, and Wichita State University of our group. This one has the most uh, interesting storyline. It was founded in 1926 as a municipal university, and that in turn was first a private university, and in 1964 became a state university. So right here in our immediate area, we have some very interesting uh, stories as to how these institutions became founded, how they're part of this great public commitment to higher education, and how it is we're all in the room together today. Well, of course, not Missouri. We didn't invite them. All right. <laughs> 
There are well-known federal influences that established this great infrastructure. Uh, a primary one was driven by the need for agricultural colleges. This led to the Morrill Act uh, signed by Abraham Lincoln, July 2nd, 1862. It has an interesting political backstory, this act, uh, the Morrill Act. Representative Justin Smith, Morrill of Vermont, was the one who introduced the bill. In the way of these things, Senator Trumbull of Illinois initiated the process for the bill, uh, but they felt that it would have a better chance of being passed through the legislature, Congress at that time, if it were introduced by an Eastern uh, representative. The land most instrumentally provided land, or the act most instrumentally provided land based on the number of senators and representatives per state. So it was 30,000 acres of federal land for each member of Congress the state had as of the census of 1860. So the enterprise was established by strategic use of federal land uh, as the basis for establishing these great public universities. Also of interest is the aims were to teach military tactics, engineering, and agricultural. Uh, the initial impetus was for the need for education on agriculture. The political reasons were it would get passed if you added military tactics and engineering, and so be it. Uh, Iowa State University, one of our neighbors here in 1862, was the first to accept the terms of the Morrill Act. And we saw that just down the road from here, our colleagues from K-State are part of an institution that was established a year after that. So as soon as the precedents were established, the process began to roll out quite quickly. What I'm going to draw to your attention today is something that is less frequently recognized, and that's the advocacy for a national university by the Founding Fathers prior to the Civil War period. President Washington advocated for a national university. In 1796, he offered 19 acres of land and 50 shares of Canal Company stock. So we see here at the very beginning was the notion that land, in this case, could be transferred from private ownership to public good by uh, being put to the use of a public university, a national university. Thomas Jefferson was a strong advocate, and in his very clever political way, he planned to recruit the whole faculty of the University of Geneva who were out of a job because they lost their government support because of the French Revolution. So he was thinking, boy, that looks like a very good package. Let's see if we can find a use for those well-educated people. He also suggested adding state aid and a location in Virginia, which is not, of course, the land that President Washington had in mind. Then the third member of this trio was James Madison, as leader in the House of Representatives, supported the initiative, noting that all men seemed to agree on the utility of the measure. Of course, we have to remember they didn't care what all women thought at that time, but all men agreed on the utility of the measure. There was a vote, however, to postpone the measure, and it carried against Madison and Washington by 37 to 36 in December of 1796, right at the end of President Washington's term. Now, the thing to note here, it was defeated not by its enemies, but by its friends. For example, one supporter voted for postponement because he questioned the timing because the transportation system was not reliable for transporting the students to the school, so he thought it was a moral issue about establishing a national university when some students might die on the way to the university. The point to remember there is watch out for your friends as well as your enemies. The other element of the political context to keep in mind here for just how really, really important this all was, Jefferson continued to support the National University initiative even as he increasingly opposed the Federalist. So keeping in mind our situation today, uh, my source on this information is a book written by a fellow, I believe I'll pronounce his name, Dupree, could it be otherwise. Anyway, the, the book was written in 1957, is filled full of wonderful detail. The quote here is the ideal of science and learning was one on which patricians could agree even while party bitterness was driving them apart. 
The last thing to note with Jefferson's support, keep in mind that science at this time was still largely conducted by very wealthy patrons of science, and Jefferson certainly was one of those. And nevertheless, he was advocating for a national public university. This is Dupree's uh, summary of that period of time. As the 18th century and the first decade of the Constitution drew to a close, more important than the negative factors are the startlingly comprehensive ideas concerning the role of science, the clarity with which the institutions were conceived, and the energy which leading statesmen expended on fostering these ideas. Only a minority saw the advantages of an alliance between science and the federal government. That small group included some of the most influential men in public life. Science has had a place in the government continuously since 1789. So this is not a recent incursion of an overbearing federal contemporary government. This is something that is intrinsic to our legacy of our government's understanding of the need for science. Let's look a little bit more at Jefferson, who in, 19, in 1806 proposed a program for the use of federal funds when the debt and the purpose of war shall not call for them. So he uh, effectively prioritized payment of the debt and conduct of our nation's defense. And after that, these were the things he felt were important, public education, roads, rivers, canals, and other objects of public improvement to add to the remuneration of federal powers. He wanted it explicitly made noted that these were important things for the federal government to be doing. He felt that education would not compete with private enterprise for a public institution can alone supply those sciences which though rarely called for are yet necessary to complete the circle, all the parts of which contribute to the improvement of the country and some of them to its preservation. He advocated that the national establishment for education be endowed by lands to generate income as a foundation independent of war. So this was an era where lands equaled resources, lands given to the public universities would set up a revenue stream uh, that would allow them to uh, sustain themselves into the future. Jefferson dreamed of a country whose political power produced enlightenment. And of course we know that Jefferson, Jefferson conducted one of the most significant and massive science experiments that was ever known at that time, and that was the Lewis and Clark expedition that went right through this part of the country. The other thing that's intrinsic to the federal support of science is the mapping of people's use of all of this land in this region that we live in was funded by the federal government. And it was part of the commitment to roads. It was part of a commitment to uh, mapping out the geography. It was part of a commitment to enhancing what was known about the natural world, all of which remain part of our national commitment to science and other uh, sources of enlightenment. So let me suggest that we have some relevant points here in the context of today's discussion of academic freedoms, freedom of expression, and social media. The first one is, and it seems to me this gets lost in some of our uh, dialogues that we're involved in today, but the first point is that the enlightened men who articulated our Bill of Rights and drafted our Constitution saw the need for public universities to contribute to the improvement of the country and to its preservation. The second point is they had to repeatedly advocate and argue for these beliefs even among those friendly to the basic premises. The third point is that the legacy of their advocacy is a great and proven system of public universities that still aim for enlightenment and public good. And the last is my reading of this is that it is our privilege and our obligation to continue that tradition in our ongoing discussions and debates. And I am so thrilled that we have today's opportunity to do that with an audience. As I look among you, I know that there are people who have thought deeply about these issues. 
And I also want to express my deep appreciation for the strong support of our public university administrations that we have with us here in the room today as well. We all have a lot of work in front of us, but it would be less than honoring our legacy, the legacy that we have to work with, if we are unable to complete uh, the tasks put in front of us. There will be real consequences for the health of these public universities if we do anything less. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Rice. Next, we have Richard Levy, Smith Distinguished Professor of Law here at KU. And he will speak to us about academic freedom, social media, and the First Amendment rights. Let me see if I can get my PowerPoint to work. So I thought I would start by emphasizing here, I have to drop a footnote because I'm a law professor. Um, <laughs> and the footnote says, the title and affiliation are provided for identification purposes only. <laughs> the views expressed herein are solely those of the author and do not in any manner represent the views of the university, university administration or university governance. So I thought that was an appropriate uh, place to start. <laughs> Um, but I also want to add my voice to those who have expressed appreciation, uh, to the administration for helping to support this activity, to Susan for bringing us together and convening this great program, and also to the members of the work group who did such an excellent job uh, of addressing the issues raised by the Board of Regents social uh, media policy. So by way of general introduction, um, I will start with the very basics. So I think most of you have figured out that the Board of Regents social media policy implicates free speech and <laughs> academic freedom issues, um, and that's why we're here today to discuss. Um, I want to emphasize that free speech and academic freedom are related but distinct concepts. So I think a lot of times we mush those two ideas together. We think free speech protects exactly academic freedom or everything that's academic freedom is, is, is protected by free speech, but, but they are distinct concepts, even though there are overlaps and relations. So my focus is on the free speech side of things. I would not profess to be an expert in academic freedom and all of its implications, uh, but I do teach constitutional law and including free speech kinds of issues, um, and so I know something about the free speech issues raised by the Board of Regents social media policy. So the analysis that I'm going to provide is basically a summary of the analysis I provided to the social media work group, which they asked for, uh, and I was happy to provide. I was grateful for the opportunity to do that. Um, my analysis is not based on comprehensive research. There are lots and lots and lots of cases out there involving public employees and free speech issues surrounding them, and I was not able to read all of them. So my analysis is based primarily on general principles of freedom of speech, leading decisions both at the Supreme Court level and some of the federal courts of appeals, uh, but I don't profess to have grounded it comprehensively uh, in the case law. So my bottom line would be to say there are some potentially serious free speech issues with the current Board of Regents policy as it sits in the Board of Regents office right now. Uh, I can't really comment on the policy that will be forthcoming and whether all of the First Amendment issues will be resolved by changes since I haven't seen those yet. So my plan is to take us through step by step and try to articulate basic free speech principles and then think about how they relate to the Board of Regents policy. So the first general point is that free speech principles do limit the kinds of social media policies that Regents and Regents institutions may adopt, but free speech protections are not absolute, so some forms of regulation are constitutionally permissible. So first of all, free speech limits apply to all government actors. If you read the First Amendment, it says Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. 
but it's never been thought to apply only to Congress. So it's always thought to apply to all federal governmental institutions. Um, and in the early part of the 20th century, under a doctrine called the Incorporation Doctrine, uh, the First Amendment was incorporated into the 14th Amendment of the Constitution and made applicable to states. And so because the regents are a state agency and the University of Kansas is a state agency, those institutions are subject to the limits of the First Amendment in the policies that they adopt. And uh, uh, therefore, any policy of the Board of Regents or the University of Kansas would have to meet those basic requirements. On the other hand, free speech is phrased in absolute terms, but it's never been understood as an absolute requirement. So the First Amendment, again, says Congress shall make no law abridging freedom of speech. And if you took that literally, you would think that no law means no law. Uh, but the Supreme Court has long held that uh, the protections of free speech are not absolute, and that in some circumstances, most famously shouting, falsely shouting fire in a crowded theater, the government can, in fact, restrict speech. So the question is whether the Board of Regents policy um, meets the requirements of free speech in the way that it limits the speech of faculty and staff. So uh, social media policies are based on the content of speech. That is, whether you violate the social media policy adopted by the Board of Regents depends on what you say. Um, and because it depends on what you say, it's especially suspect in First Amendment terms and will ordinarily be uh, strictly scrutinized, subject to the most rigorous kinds of, of limits. So the reason for that is, under a free speech theory, um, free speech preserves or provides a marketplace of ideas so that the truth uh, comes out in the interplay and battle of ideas, competing ideas for acceptance, rather than allowing government to prescribe truth or orthodoxy. So when, that's one function of free speech theory. A second aspect of free speech theory is that free speech is essential to de democratic self-government. And that includes the need to be able to criticize the government without any fear of retribution. So those two principles are central to the way the Supreme Court thinks about free speech. Um, and content-based restrictions, that is restrictions that turn on what you say, are seen as the most dangerous kinds because content-based restrictions distort the marketplace of ideas. They keep some ideas out of the marketplace. Also, history has shown that content-based restrictions often target dissent or desi are designed to suppress criticism of government or conventional ideas. So the ordinary rule would say a content-based policy like the social media policy adopted by the Board of Regents would have to be defended uh, against the most rigorous kind of scrutiny and would almost certainly be unconstitutional. However, and there's always a however in law, so however, um, there are categories of speech traditional categories of speech that are seen as outside the scope of the First Amendment so that government can regulate them. Um, the uh, common examples would include incitement of violent or unlawful conduct, uh, what are called fighting words, words that by their very utterance inflict injury and are likely to provoke an immediate violent response, threats, other kinds of illegal speech like blackmail, uh, and so on. So these categories of speech can be regulated. They can even be made a crime. However, they're not completely unprotected. And in particular, the Supreme Court has recently said you can't target speech within these categories uh, from a particular viewpoint. So let me try to elaborate on these points. Uh, first of all, the idea of incitement which is, some t is one of the elements of the Board of Regents uh, social media policy, is defined very narrowly. You can only uh, be guilty of unprotected incitement if your speech is directed to inciting immediate unlawful conduct and likely to incite immediate unlawful conduct. And very few uh, instances of prosecution for incitement satisfy this test. Likewise, the fighting words doctrine is also very, very narrow. 
and only applies to the most extreme forms of insults that no person will accept without uh, violently responding. Um, and courts often will strike down laws that try to limit this kind of speech because they're either vague or overbroad uh, concepts that I'll try to elaborate on in just a minute. Um, so the, the second key point is that if you have a law or policy restricting these categories, you can't target a subcategory to suppress unpopular ideas. The most common application of this principle would be hate speech codes. So although many forms of hate speech would be fighting words and uh, you, you, a law that prohibited fighting words would be okay, you can't pick only the fighting words that are um, racist in character and then leave fighting words that are anti-racist unpunished. That's targeting a particular viewpoint and the Supreme Court has said that kind of a rule is unconstitutional. So whatever social media policies target particularly uh, inciting kinds of speech or speech that might constitute fighting words have to be even-handed in terms of the kinds of viewpoints that they would prohibit. Um, another important limit on free speech rights in this context is that university faculty and staff uh, their free speech rights are limited in some ways because of their employment status. So you know, the Supreme Court has said that although we have the right to speak on, as private citizens on matters of public concern, that right is protected by the First Amendment, it has to be weighed against the government, in this case the university's legitimate interest, as an employer in maintaining an effective workforce. So speech as a private citizen that might severely undermine the ability of the university to carry out its mission could be the subject of sanctions under the Supreme Court's uh, analysis. Now, uh, the test that I'm talking about here, the balancing test, is called the Pickering balancing test because of the case in which it originated. Um, and uh, the Pickering balancing test was originated in the context of public school teachers criticizing a school board. It's been applied a lot to police departments and other kinds of government agencies. Um, and the law, the cases generally indicate that the mission of the government agency is an important factor in deciding how the balancing test applies. Since the university's mission uh, and the principle of academic freedom include open uh, inquiry and the ability to express a broad range of opinions without fear of sanction, it's likely that the balancing test would be applied with a thumb very heavily on the scale of free speech um, and that it would be especially difficult for a university to discipline a faculty or staff member uh, for their speech as uh, private citizens on matters of public concern. So the discipline and uh, efficiency of the police department is a different kind of consideration than the interests of the university. And uh, the courts would likely recognize the university's special need uh, to recognize free speech. Um, now, one of the uh, biggest problems, I think, for many with the Board of Regents policy is that the uh, Pickering test is designed as a test to evaluate what administrators do when they take employment-related actions. It's, it's not designed uh, as a test or a, a, a standard for speech or conduct that speakers pay attention to. It's not designed as a rule for speakers to follow. It's uh, designed as a rule for administrators to follow. And as such, it may not give enough guidance to speakers uh, about what they may or may not say, which is something I want to talk about again in just uh, a little bit more in just a minute. So um, another important feature when we're talking about public employees is that when they're speaking not as private citizens on matters of public concern, but rather uh, in the performance of their duties, the Supreme Court has said they have no free speech rights, that that speech is not protected at all by the First Amendment. 
Um, that's a, a case called Garcetti versus Sabalos for those of you who want to look it up. Um, that case involved a lawyer working for the district attorney's office in LA who basically refused to toe the line to what uh, his superior wanted him to say. Um, and the Supreme Court said, well, he was working as a prosecutor for the city. He had to say what the city wanted him to say. He couldn't claim any First Amendment rights. Now, pointedly, the Supreme Court in that case said, we're not talking about academic institutions. We're not talking about academic teaching or writing, and the same rule might not apply. So uh, that's a kind of open area which is unclear. Um, so since the court expressly stated that universities might be different because of the principle of academic freedom, lower courts have to address this issue, and the results are mixed. So uh, a lot of cases have said the Garcetti rule applies uh, and gone ahead and said no First Amendment rights. But few, if any, of those cases involve academic teaching or writing, scholarship, et cetera, that would be squarely within the scope of academic freedom. And the more recent decisions, particularly there's a couple of Uni United States Court of Appeals decisions um, that have said the Garcetti rule does not apply to academics, um, and, and therefore the Pickering balancing test would continue to apply even to work-related speech that academics are engaged in. So that's a, an area of uncertainty. Um, still, the Board of Regents policy as it currently stands would appear to say that any time anything we do that's work-related is contrary to the interests of the university, um, we, we could be disciplined. Um, and that, as written, would apply to academic writing or teaching or other activities that are within the scope of academic freedom. I would say that's a very serious First Amendment issue um, under the policy as it currently stands. Um, and I would, if I were giving legal advice to the Board of Regents, I would say that that's, uh, you're exposed, I guess I would say, if, uh, uh, if this policy stays in place as, as written. Um, now, I want to talk about two special doctrines that are relevant to what's going on with the social media policy. The first one's called the overbreadth doctrine. Um, and under the overbreadth doctrine, I if you're targeting speech that's unprotected, but your law is too broad, it sweeps too broadly and brings it some protected speech, it's unconstitutional. Um, so that's a, a kind of special rule to make sure that we keep uh, speech-related regulations in check that well-intentioned regulations of speech don't sweep too broadly um, and chill or target uh, protected speech. So, um, for example, if you write a, a policy that targets incitement or that targets fighting words, if your definition's too broad so that the policy might apply to speech that's not fighting words or that's not incitement, then uh, it, it could be struck down as unconstitutional. Now, the Regents policy didn't target fighting words, but it did target incitement. Um, and in the wording of the current policy doesn't adhere to the narrow definition as uh, articulated by Supreme Court cases and might be overbroad because it doesn't require an intent to incite uh, or that uh, uh, incitement is likely to occur. Um, so that's a potential issue as well with the policy as it's currently drafted. Um, in a broader sense, I've been trying to figure out how you could ever use incite, uh, uh, social media in a way that would violate in, uh, the incitement principle or the fighting words doctrine. Those usually require a much more direct face-to-face -face contact, much greater immediacy of the likely outcome than we would ever see with a uh, social media post. Um, and so uh, I think it would be hard to write a social media policy that would ever reach speech and uh, that, that uh, would constitute incitement or fighting words. Um, finally, we have the vagueness doctrine. So um, under the vagueness doctrine, if, if a law regulates speech, it has to be sufficiently clear to put speakers on notice of what speech is prohibited 
and to prevent arbitrary and discriminatory enforcement of the law. Um, and this is a general due process doctrine, not just a free speech doctrine, but it has special weight in the context of free speech. Um, and the court's much more likely to strike down a law regulating speech as unconstitutionally vague. And this is where I think the regent's policy dealing with pickering uh, might be a problem. Because vague regulations of speech are likely to chill speech. That's the term that, uh, uh, that the court has used. That is, people will self-censor in order to avoid uh, running afoul of a vague law. You want to steer clear. You don't know uh, w whether or not you might be prosecuted. So you, better to be quiet than to uh, come close to the line. Um, and the Supreme Court has indicated that's a special concern when dealing with speech. So I think that's a problem with using a test like the Pickering balancing test to tell people what they can and cannot say. So from the perspective of a speaker, you have to ask yourself, if I say this, will the university decide that um, the disruptive effect of my speech is too great in light of my uh, f free speech rights? And people might steer clear of saying anything controversial lest um, they uh, suffer some sort of employment-related response. Um, and so that's a, I think that's a significant problem with the use of Pickering in the policy the way it has been used, um, especially because uh, the judgment that determines whether or not you have done something wrong is somebody else's judgment. So you don't have an objective test that you can use to decide whether or not your speech is permitted or not. You have to guess at what somebody else will think about whether your speech exceeds the balance. Um, and under the cases dealing with the vagueness doctrine in free speech, the lack of an objective standard is one of the most common failures or defects in statutes or policies. And so uh, that might be an issue under the uh, free speech policy adopted by the Board of Regents as well, especially since there's no requirement of intent or knowledge or even recklessness about the, the policy. So one might inadvertently say something that would be sufficiently problematic to stray across the, the line. Um, so I think there are, in the current policy, several key problems. One problem is that it applies to academic uh, activities like research and teaching um, that uh, are arguably protected, um, notwithstanding the Garcetti case. A second problem is that pieces of it that target unprotected speech are written too broadly and therefore might run afoul of the overbreadth doctrine. And then the third problem is that the speech addressing um, uh, what you can say as a private citizen on matters of public concern is written in a vague way uh, that, that might chill speech in violation of the First Amendment. So that's my summary. I hope it's been helpful, um, and I hope we have a chance to talk about these issues uh, after everyone's done. Thanks very much. I wish I'd heard that before I wrote my remarks, <laughs> as you'll see. Um, <coughs> next, we have uh, Charles Epp, who is um, Professor of uh, Public Affairs and Administration at KU, and uh, Kevin Johnson, Professor School of Business and General Counsel uh, at ESU. And uh, this is the report uh, on, on the Kansas Board of Regents work group on the social media policy. So a, a report from from the group who were there now. Yeah, let's turn that off. I guess muting would be appropriate. Oh, no, I probably didn't want to do that. Display mute. Did I turn it? No. No, let's try it again. All right. All right. Forgive me, I, I don't have a PowerPoint to, for you today. Uh, 
Thanks, Phil, for the introduction. Thank you, Susan, for organizing uh, this symposium. And I especially want to thank the distinguished professors of Kansas universities who've led the effort over the last number of months. They've been an inspiration. And finally, I want to thank the leaders of the universities, and especially uh, Chancellor Gray Little here and, and Provost David Vitter, whose support for academic freedom has been crystal clear throughout the process. Thank you. Um, uh, so, uh, Kevin Johnson is not here today. He couldn't make it this morning, so I'll be speaking on behalf of the work group. And, I, and in fact, I'm going to, at the end, branch beyond our report to say a few things about what I think the regents uh, may have done with our recommendations, because I think that will be useful for our uh, discussion of Plan B later on. In that portion of the remarks, I'm just going to be speaking on my own behalf with my own interpretations. Um, uh, first, I'd like to say just a little bit about uh, the, uh, the process that we used. As you, uh, as you know, uh, when the controversy burst forth in December and early January, the regents decided that they should get some advice from faculty and staff, and so they formed a work group. Uh, they, they, they formed a group of 13 members, uh, two from each of the regents' institutions and one from the KU Med Center. One from each of the institutions was a faculty member, one was a staff member. Uh, from among that group, uh, two people were picked as co-chairs, Kevin Johnson from Emporia State and myself. Kevin is, is uh, general counsel there, so he's a representative of the staff, but he's also a faculty member in the School of Business there, so he has a, a faculty perspective on the issue as well. Uh, this was a working group. We met uh, some four or five times between late January and early April. Uh, when we met, we met for uh, at least half a day, sometimes much longer than that. Every member of the group worked very hard, brought a lot of material to the table, and so uh, they deserve thanks from all of their own uh, institutions and university communities. I'd like to say just a bit about the stuff that we covered in the course of that process. I want to bullet a few things that we looked at so you have a sense of all the kinds of materials that we looked at before I get to the substance of our report. We examined for example, risks of disruption to universities from uh, uses of social media and from other kinds of controversies arising out of uh, faculty and staff expression. As you know, these sorts of disruptions occur periodically and we thought it was important to take into account that context. We looked at uh, uses of social media in higher education so that we would have a sense, a very clear sense of how these emerging technologies are used in productive ways and responsible ways in the universities. We examined uh, the principles of academic freedom and responsibility as these have been articulated by the American Association of University Professors and also uh, as they've been institutionalized in uh, the policies of various universities across the country. We examined First Amendment law and on this, we had an excellent report from uh, Professor Rick Levy that you've uh, heard about here. And I want to thank him particularly for the, the helpfulness of that report, which we used throughout our process, our, our discussions. We finally examined social media policies at universities across the country to look at how these policies have been developed. Uh, if you've seen our report, you know that we found that those policies are universally advisory rather than disciplinary. Uh, and that formed a basis for our suggestion to move to an advisory policy in the state of Kansas rather than a disciplinary policy. And then one last thing. We also looked at existing policies in Kansas universities to see how they might be used or how they can be used to address misuses of social media uh, that already, uh, th these policies are already in place. We don't necessarily need, we found, an, an additional social media policy to fill any gap on this question. So let me talk now about our, our report, what we uh, uh, generated out of all of these analyses. Basically, we suggest shifting the premise of the social media policy that the regents have developed. The board's policy starts from the premise that uses of social media represent a unique risk to the universities because of the disruptions that can arise in response to inflammatory tweets and the like, and that this risk is best addressed through legal tools provided by court decisions governing the speech of public employees. In the view of the work group, 
those premises are not a good place to start in developing a policy that is to guide expression in universities for a couple reasons. And I want to just note them quickly and then move on to some, some broader issues. First, social media are very useful and valuable forms of communication in supporting the research and teaching missions of the universities. And we felt that their responsible use should be encouraged rather than discouraged with a punitive policy. Second, and here I'm going to build on uh, Professor Levy's analysis, the law governing public employee speech is at best awkwardly applied in a higher education context. Most case law in this area addresses speech by employees in other types of government agencies, as he's mentioned. For example, the speech of police officers in police departments. Uh, key court decisions in these areas increasingly authorize these kinds of agencies to control the speech of their employees to better serve the agency's interests. Uh, and these precedents seem an imperfect fit, as I say at best, to the higher education context. I want to return to that point and, and build on it in, in, in just a bit. Now, in contrast to that premise, uh, risks of, of, of social media, the law governing employee speech is the way to proceed. The work group based our recommendation on a very different premise. And I want to spell that out here for just a moment and then talk about the implications of that. The premise, if you've seen our report, of our, of our report is the mission of the, of the public universities. And this mission is to serve the state. We are public institutions. But to serve it in a particular way, by advancing knowledge and by educating students. As we say in our report, this mission requires, as an essential condition, clear and un unambiguous protection for the free exchange of ideas. This is commonly called academic freedom, as we all know. And our report talks about the meaning of this. And uh, you know, a couple elements that are well known and very important are, as the AAUP principles from 1940 state, full freedom in research and in the publication of the results, and freedom in the classroom in discussing the subject. But the mission of the universities also requires faculty and staff to honor an accompanying set of academic responsibilities. The most basic of these, uh, in addition to meeting classes, doing service, and so forth, the most basic of these is to evaluate ideas <coughs> according to the standards and procedures appropriate in each discipline, and not to evaluate ideas by whether they are popular or in keeping with current fashion, or by how controversial they are, or by how disruptive are people who dislike those ideas and seek to disrupt the, the university in response. And so as we say in our report, the social media policy is, we think, so vigorously opposed in the university communities, not just because it intrudes on the free exchange of ideas, which it does, but it also is opposed because it's inconsistent with our deeply felt sense of responsibility, too, to evaluate ideas on the basis of their merit and not other grounds. So with this said, as a, a, a set of principles or operating premises, I'd like to discuss the two provisions of the social media policy now that are, are problematic in light of, of the principles of academic freedom and responsibility, with an emphasis on responsibility, and how we as a work group propose to revise those two provisions. The first of these provisions is provision two of the, of the uh, 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 document. It's based on a Supreme Court decision called Garcetti versus Sabalos from 19, uh, 2006. And, and Rick Levy has just talked about it. But I want to amplify some of the things that he said. This decision held that the speech of public employees that is per made pursuant to job duties is not protected by the First Amendment. And so uh, the social media policy second provision directly quotes that decision. It directly applies it within Kansas universities, and it uses that language to authorize discipline for uses of social media that are made pursuant to job duties and are contrary to the interests of uh, the university. Since official duties within the university include teaching and research, this pr provision removes any protection for the core areas of professional speech traditionally protected by the principles of academic freedom. And so when uh, members of the Board of Regents uh, try to reassure faculty that the policy does not infringe on First Amendment rights, 
and simply restates the law of the First Amendment, as we've heard a number of times over the last several months, I am not uh, entirely reassured because that the policy uses language from a recent Supreme Court decision that withdraws protection, First Amendment protection, for core areas of academic expression. Now it's true, as Professor Levy has just said, that Garcetti specifically sets aside the university context and says, we'll decide that question later. Uh, and it's also true that some federal courts have held that this decision does not apply within higher education. But note, I, I, I will say something that he reported to us in his report but didn't mention here. The Tenth Circuit, which is the circuit in which Kansas is in, that Court of Appeals has not yet addressed this question and has not yet affirmatively said whether Garcetti, the exception, applies in the state of Kansas. Uh, and so, the, it, I might say, we might say, here in Kansas, the question is a live one. It's open to debate. And notably, it is striking that in the Kansas Board of Regents policy, provision two strikes the balance on the side of applying the Garcetti exception to Kansas universities, meaning it says speech pursuant to job duties is not protected. That's uh, problematic. It's deeply concerning. Now, I will return to this in, in a bit at the end. The Regents uh, Governance Committee, in the last several days, when we met with them last, uh, last Wednesday, uh, announced some changes that are not yet published which may have qualified this point. And I want to return to that. And that's a very significant development if it turns out to be true. Uh, I want to now turn to the other problematic provision of the social media policy, which is the fourth provision, uh, which uh, Rick Levy again talked about just a bit ago. I, I assume most people in the room are familiar with it. Um, nonetheless, if I might uh, read it for you, I think it would be helpful uh, for the discussion that I'm going to pursue in, uh, here after the, after the quotation of it. It states that a use of social media is improper and subject to discipline if and here the quote begins, subject to the balancing analysis required by the following paragraph, it impairs discipline by superiors or harmony among coworkers, has a detrimental impact on close working relationships for which personal loyalty and confidence are necessary, impedes the performance of the speaker's official duties, interferes with the regular operation of the university, or otherwise adversely affects the university's ability to efficiently provide services. And then it goes on. In determining whether the employee's communication constitutes an improper use of social media under paragraph four, the chief executive officer shall balance the interest of the university in promoting the efficiency of the public services it performs uh, through its employees against the employee's right as a citizen to speak on matters of public concern. And I'll stop there, but it, it, does, it does go on a bit further than that. Now that's the, the famous or the infamous Pickering balancing test. And I'm told that lawyers know what this language means, what sorts of uses of social media are prohibited by it, or at least have a decent sense of that, but I have yet to meet a faculty or staff member who's not a lawyer, who claims to know what that language means and what so uses of social media are prohibited uh, by it. In fact, it looks to many people like a punitive restriction on speech, even though the lawyers will say that in practice it's fairly protective of the speech of employees, but it sure looks like a punitive res restriction. Uh, the, the basic problem is that balancing tests like this are ambiguous as guides to action, and particularly so in this case when it is written as a guide for expression. Um, and in fact, in this context, as uh, Professor Levy has just said, the answer, what is protected and what's not, depends on whether there is a disruptive reaction to the speech, not what was said. And it also depends on how university leaders weigh the seriousness of that disruption. Uh, these are things that are very hard for a typical person to judge in advance of making the expression. As in so many other things in life here, perception becomes reality, and if faculty and staff view this language as restrictive and punitive, there's a real risk. There's a real risk, as he's just said, even a likelihood that they will avoid not only uses of social media that are contrary to law and policy, but also many other uses of social media that are perfectly legitimate and even valuable contributions to higher education. 
If I could say, add one other point to this. The problem is compounded by the fact that many of the cases that have been applying the Pickering balancing test in recent years uh, have increasingly sided with the interests of the public employers in controlling the expression of, of employees. Now, these are cases outside of the area of higher education. I want to give you one example, which we cite in the report, uh, that came down in early February in Georgia, Duke versus Hamill. It's an, interesting, it's an interesting case. Bobby Hamill was a police officer in the campus police of Clayton State University in Georgia, public university there. Uh, upon the re-election of, of Obama, President Obama, in uh, 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 2012, uh, Bobby Hamill posted on his personal Facebook page an image of a Confederate flag along with the words, it's time for the second revolution. Uh, these are inflammatory words, there's no doubt about it, and especially so when they come from a police officer in a public university. Uh, within an hour, Bobby Hamill thought better of it, and he took that post down, but somebody had taken a screenshot of it and sent it to a local TV station and had uh, identified him as a, uh, a police officer employed by a state university. The story exploded into controversy. As a result, Hamill was demoted. He was not fired, he was demoted. Uh, he sued, saying that his First Amendment rights to expression on a hot political topic had been violated. The district court that heard the case upheld the demotion as consistent with his First Amendment rights to freedom of expression under the Pickering balancing test based on the claim by Clayton State University that its police department's reputation had been harmed by that post. Not that it had disrupted the department in significant ways, but that its reputation had been harmed. As I say, most of these kinds of cases applying Pickering in recent years have not, been, uh, have not uh, 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 been in the university context, or if they've been in the university context, they've been about the expression of staffers who are not uh, faculty members or teaching staffers. Um, and it, it's true, let me say this very clearly, that there may be very good and legitimate reasons for striking the Pickering balancing test, or the Pickering balance, as I should say, more toward the employer's side in a case like Hamill involving a command level police officer. Uh, but this only complicates the task that faculty and staff have if, as we've been advised, take a look at the case law, it's protective of expression, when we try to apply that in a university context. And we emphasized in the report, as Professor Levy did here, that you have to interpret this test in a university context in light of the unique mission of the universities. Uh, but for most faculty and staff who look at these cases, and the look of that, how they've come down, they say, oh my goodness, these are actually not as protective as we might like, and they get uh, a sense uh, uh, that uh, uh, if applied uh, here, uh, there's trouble. Uh, we think starting from the university mission is the, is the key place to start in this, in this policy, and this leads to a more robust and clear uh, set of guidances uh, favoring expression. I'd like to now say, uh, a bit about our uh, proposed revisions to the, to the uh, social media policy. And also here I'd like to say what I think the Board of Regents Governance Committee has done with those as a, as a, as a jumping off point for later discussions today. I want to emphasize that my interpretation of what they've done is based on a bunch of notes I took last Wednesday. Uh, and we haven't yet seen their language, so it is, uh, some of this is, is a bit speculative, but some of it is, in my mind, I think, quite clear. Uh, uh, we recommended, most basically, as you know, shifting the policy from a focus on discipline to a focus on advice. Uh, uh, as you know, the, work, the, uh, the, the Board of Regents uh, has not gone with that. They're, they're staying with a disciplinary policy. And for many faculty and staff, that's a, that's a real concern. But in other ways, they seem to have uh, changed their language in pretty significant ways. And so let me run through some ways in which they have. I want to conclude uh, after this list with my own sense of what this means. And again, this is, this is interpretation. It's in part, at this point, speculative. We recommended changing the overall tone of the policy based on our emphasis on the university missions and based on the importance of free speech in this and, and academic freedom in this context, uh, I somewhat doubt that the tone of the entire policy will be changed in ways that we would have favored. 
but it's pretty clear that at least the first half of the language now will, inco will include, incorp uh, will, excuse me, will incorporate uh, 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 very clear expressions of support for the First Amendment and for academic freedom. That goes some bit, perhaps not as, more, as far as I would like, but some bit toward making that tone more friendly to the university environment. Um, is the glass half full or half empty? Uh, we will each interpret that at the end, but I think it's, they're, they're making progress on that, on that point. Uh, we recommend at beginning uh, the policy with a preamble that states that its purpose is to encourage responsible uses of social media rather than its purpose being to uh, punish. And uh, apparently that will be there. Uh, we recommended including in the policy a forthright statement uh, of support for the First Amendment. Uh, apparently that will be there. We recommended, and here's a, here's a recommendation that I think is especially crucial as a matter of process. We recommended requiring that any discipline over uses of social media should, we, should be made not unilaterally by the CEOs as the original policy would have had it, but should be done through existing university disciplinary processes. Uh, the governance committee seems to have accepted that, uh, although we'll have to see what the actual language is, but, uh, but from the discussion last Wednesday, it seems as if they have, have accepted that, and that's a very good thing if they have. Uh, I think many of us would, would like to see an explicit endorsement of using peer review processes, especially for faculty. I'm not sure if that will be there. We'll see. What about the two really problematic provisions that I just discussed? Provision 2 and Provision 4. Uh, with regard to uh, Provision 2, the Garcetti language provision, we, of course, the work group recommended striking it from the policy, simply removing it. We think it's deeply problematic. Uh, the Governance Committee is not going to do that. The language will remain exactly as it was before, uh, but we also did something else which they seem to have accepted. We recommended replacing that provision with some explicit protections for expression in the areas of research, teaching, and shared governance. And we wrote that as, a, as essentially as exclusions from the policy. The policy shall not uh, 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 be used to affect expressions in the area of research, teaching, and, and shared governance. Uh, the, the, the regents seem to have accepted that language and placed it above their list of restrictions. All right? Uh, that is, if done as a set of legal exclusions and forcible protections, is very, very significant. Because all the rest of the punitive language addresses then other kinds of expressions. The core areas of academic freedom are, are protected. But the devil is in the details. We'll have to see what that language looks like wh when it comes out. And I think it's unwise for me to speculate about what it precisely will be. Will it be hortatory uh, 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 protections for these areas, or will, they be, will these protections be legally enforceable? We, I, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. Uh, with regard to the fourth provision, the Pickering balancing test provision, Again, the work group rec recommended striking that provision from the policy. We thought it was so deeply problematic, so confusing for faculty, so restrictive in, in all kinds of ways, we thought it best not to be there. Um, and we replaced it, as you may know, with this quote from the AAUP's 1940 statement of, uh, uh, affirming the right of faculty and staff to, I, I guess it says faculty, to, to uh, speak on matters of public concern as citizens, uh, and then a reminder, a hortatory reminder that when you do so, speak re respectfully and be mindful of the impact of your expressions on your own reputation and those of the institution. Uh, so we replaced uh, an awkward, difficult, painful, pickering balancing test with a, what looks like a faculty-friendly hortatory advisory balancing test, if you will. One that's not legally enforceable, but gives good advice, I think. Uh, the governance committee last Wednesday seems to have fully retained the Pickering balancing test language, but they're also taking this 1940 AAUP quote and putting it up near the top of the whole policy as a, as a sort of frame setting, uh, a preamble kind of uh, provision. Now, what is the significance of that? I, I, I'll have to be frank. It can go either way. I'm not sure whether this makes the tone of the policy better or worse. <laughs> On the one hand, this, the, you know, the statement is a good statement. 
and it provides an assurance of faculty rights to speak as private citizens. On the other hand, in the context of a policy that remains disciplinary, this is a hortatory statement that says, be respectful. And uh, we don't necessarily want to impose discipline when, according to somebody's interpretation, a faculty member has been disrespectful in an expression. Now, that can't, isn't legally enforceable, of course, but some readers will say, this is problematic. Maybe I should be very careful in what I say as, re as, a, re uh, as a result of this, uh, of this uh, uh, policy here. All right, I'd like to wrap up, and uh, in doing so, I'd like to address a broad question. If this policy has been revised in the ways that I think it has, in the ways that I've summarized here, just what is the character of this revised policy? Uh, that will be a subject for all of us to discuss uh, over the coming months. Uh, it, it is a policy that will include admonitions to respect academic freedom and the First Amendment at the same time that it includes what appears to be still legally enforceable language that withdraws some protections for work-related speech. Uh, it affirms the First Amendment at the same time that it includes this awkward and difficult balancing language drawn from Pickering and its uh, uh, subsequent cases. In my view, and this is, this is I am, I, I, I'm sticking my neck out, and I suppose on YouTube I shouldn't do that, but <laughs> I, this, the policy will now amount to a more complicated balancing test. Um, let me say this. If we're going to have a balancing test, it's far better to have one that affirms, explicitly states up front that a big part of the balance are the values that are essential to a <laughs> university community. Freedom for research, free expression and teaching, freedom and shared governance. That helps fill out the balance in ways that uh, were distinctly absent in the, in the, in the original version. Uh, so if we're going to have a balancing test, that's, it's good to have. I would rather we didn't have that test in there. I think it's still deeply problematic. Uh, but it seems to be a step in the right direction. How far is that step? Boy, I hesitate to give you uh, a number because that indicates how significant this will be in practice. I, I just don't know. One last thing, if we learned anything from Regent Logan's presentation at KU a couple days ago, it is this, that the universities will now have, and he gave us an explicit affirmation of this, a real opportunity to bring clarity to this policy in ways that provide very clear legal assurances of protection for faculty and staff expression. And I think that's going to be our task in the coming months, to write those university-based policies in ways that are acceptable to faculty and staff, in ways that set up meaningful peer review processes, uh, and uh, in ways that make that balancing test clear and understandable and protective for faculty and staff. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for those illuminating talks. And uh, we have time for questions, and we have microphones for the questions so that we can all hear you, but also so that the cameras can hear you for the live streaming part of this <coughs> and uh, the YouTube version. Your, your comments will be recorded and, and broadcast. So uh, any questions? Any questions about any of the, the presentations that we've just heard? Yes. Is this working? Can you hear me? Uh, can I address a question, especially to the last? Introduce yourself. Surely, Jonathan Clark. I'm an historian at KU. I'm not a lawyer, but I'm fascinated by the law. And if perhaps I could address a question which is especially aimed at our two last speakers. Uh, it's a two-part question, really. The first part is to say that if the regents believe that their policy is based on a particular application of the Garcetti case, then will they not presume that the restrictions that they're urging in the sphere of social media apply also to all forms of expression, 
uh, by all state employees, including professors, whether they are in social media or not. In that case, the cable policy is probably much more extensive in its implications than even its revised version might lead us to think. And the second part of my question bears on it, which is this. Uh, the regents must have taken legal advice. Do we know from whom they took legal advice? Uh, do we have confidence in the caliber of that legal advice? Or do we think that perhaps this is a document which is becoming uh, legally um, uh, incompetent, not expert, uh, not safe as, as a premise for um, state policy. <laughs> you get the talking stick here. Uh, uh, I'm going to respond to the uh, second question, part of the question first. Um, I believe they did take legal advice. Um, I believe there was legal advice from um, Julene Miller, who is the general counsel from the Board of Regents, and my understanding is that they also ran the policy by the Attorney General's office, which gave them uh, advice and, and participated. Um, I'm not prepared to articulate a view on whether they, the advice is competent or not competent, um, but I will say the policy as it currently stands exposes the regents and the universities to potential liability or uh, could easily be found unconstitutional. So were I giving legal advice, I would caution against the policy as it currently stands because there are risks. Uh, still, I can't say with certainty that it's unconstitutional either. Um, so uh, now the, the first question related to whether uh, the principles that are reflected in this policy apply to other forms of speech. Um, and I guess the answer to that depends on whether the policy creates a new ground for dismissal or disciplinary action or simply uh, articulates existing grounds uh, in a more specific form. If it creates a new ground, then the scope of the policy would be limited to social media because that's the scope of the policy. If it is an expression of the view of the Board of Regents that power already exists to take these actions and they're simply summarizing the already existent power, then it would presumably apply to anything, any other form of speech. Uh, I read the policy as a new ground, so that's both a, a plus and a minus. Uh, as a plus, it limits the scope, but as a minus, it would seem to create a new disciplinary basis where one did not previously exist. I hope that's responsive, John. Do you, you want to answer no. some other questions? <coughs> yeah, Richard DeGeorge, KU. I have two questions. One is, on my understanding, the policy says the CEO has the authority to take punitive action. It doesn't say the CEO has to take punitive action depending on what the Board of Regents says or, or the legislature says or public expression says. Mm -hmm. Is that correct, that the CEO could decide and wouldn't be putting his or her job on the line because they take the wrong policy? That would be the first question. Second one is, you say that the universities will be able to write documents. How far can they go in interpreting the, the Board of Regents document so as to make it really in effect what your committee has recommended? This will be a subject of debate over coming months, but it's my real sense from the signals that we're getting from the Board of Regents that the universities have broad latitude to write the policies that they think are appropriate within their settings. And that means that they can write very protective policies, pr protective of, of expression, academic freedom, and so forth. Uh, I th it, my sense is also they can incorporate whatever kinds of procedural protections <coughs> that they want to in that in that policy. Uh, 
Uh, I guess I would just add, I, I do think the discretion given to the CEOs of the universities um, is something of a blessing and a curse for the CEOs of the, of the universities. So w without the policy, there is an extent to which a university official could go to politicians or others that are putting pressure on to take action and say, uh, I have no authority to take action. Um, that position is harder to take uh, when the power is given expressly by regulation. So uh, I think it would require greater uh, fortitude on the behalf of the university's leaders to stand up to political pressure uh, as, as the policy now stands than before without the policy. Yes, I have a question. Um, first of all, my, I'm Jonathan Mayhew. Um, and I'd like to commend the work of this of this group. Um, what's the where is the line of demarcation between one's private speech as a private citizen and w speech that would be governed by Garcetti in terms of speech you're doing as part of your official duties, um, especially in terms of, you know, social media, if I tweet something related to a blog post that I've written, I mean, that's, is that part of my research? Or is it part of my, you know, it could have something to do with my research or it could be uh, my private opinion. So I'm not sure where that line of separation exists. It's a great question, and one of the challenges, this is an area called uh, ex protections for what are called extramural speech. And one of the challenges is that for academics, the line is, is pretty blurry. And that's why the AAUP and universities across the country have always given pretty robust protections for what is called extramural speech, speaking as a citizen. Uh, a lot of times when we speak in public, what we say is based in our research or, uh, or somewhat related to it. Now, on the other hand, sometimes what we say is entirely separate from our research. Um, it, it's a, it's a, there's, there's a gray area there. Um, I think I should let Rick address what is pursuant to official duties under Garcetti. Uh, I have a sense of it, but I'll probably garble the answer to that. There is a legal definition of that. Um, I guess I can't really add anything to what Chuck said, because I think that what's pursuant to your official duties, particularly in the academic setting, is entirely in the eye of the beholder. So uh, as, as a constitutional law professor, I get asked to talk on constitutional issues all the time in, in public settings. Um, I'm not being asked because as a person, people like me, they're asking me because I have a position and a title that uh, gives me credibility as, as a person who's a knowledgeable on constitutional issues. So then that's why they want me. I'm not sure any of that is, is unrelated to my work. Um, and I, I almost think as, a, as soon as you identify yourself as somebody who's uh, a faculty member and you claim some credibility or expert knowledge, uh, as a faculty member on some subject, uh, there's at least an argument to be made that that's pursuant to your official duties because you're uh, disseminating knowledge that you've acquired um, using your position as a faculty member. So I think that you're absolutely right to be very concerned that there's a broad, broad uh, line that might be drawn around official duties for academic speech. Yes, Harry Humphreys from Pittsburgh State University. I'm now the president of our union here, PSU KNEA. And the question I have is, of course, on December 18th, I was like, like everybody else, grading my exams and uh, getting ready to go to Italy. I'm just wondering, how is the Board of Regents going to respond to the bad publicity they've got, not just in Kansas, but throughout the United States, and also with uh, other parts of the world. I mean, this is really a, not just a, a Kansas issue. This happens to be one I think other 
universities. This hit the Chronicle of Higher Education and so on. Also, I just want to point out that I did consult with our lawyers, the key and e lawyers, and they seem to think that the constitutional arguments are kind of a weaker argument. They seem to think that really what you have is conditions of employment arguments that would be much stronger if you guys were, if the other universities were organized. I'm just wondering what you folks think about that issue. Well, um, in, in terms of conditions of employment, I'm not an expert on labor law. Um, and there's, a, I think that every, not every change in policy that might affect working conditions can be seen as a change in the contract, um, at least when there's no union and it's not part of a collective bargaining process and within the scope of the collective bargaining agreement. Um, so I don't know, I, I, I'm, I'm somewhat skeptical that a contract argument would work outside of the union context, but uh, there's certainly a possibility. Uh, and this is an issue we've talked about here within governance at various points in time as well, is sort of when do policies cross the line from uh, change in policy and become change in the terms and conditions of employment that might require uh, as contract renegotiation of some kind. Um, so uh, I, I can't guarantee that the First Amendment is stronger than the contract argument, but um, I, I think that the First Amendment principle is a critically important one here, um, especially as it relates to academic freedom. So I'm John Leslie from Kansas State, and the question that I've got is, K-State has a large contingent of extension faculty whose sole job is outreach to the public. And the outreach often is on very controversial issues. Should you adopt GMO crops? What do you do to implement the Affordable Care Act if you're in a small business in a small town, a farmer? How is this restriction, of, because much of what they put out is on a blog or through social media, going to uh, impact what our extension service is going to be able to do? Uh, if the um, exclusions for research, teaching, and shared governance that we recommended should be in the policy, are in fact in the policy after after the Board of Regents gets done with it, uh, most of what you do in those in those areas should be completely protected, and you should have uh, a full sense of, of security in that. Um, if not, I think that there is a legitimate concern because you're speaking pursuant to job duties when you're out there. With regard to the second, the Pickering element, the balancing test, you know, it is, I mean, it's ambiguous, but the test for whether you can be disciplined for an expression really is whether the, whether the response to the expression is so disruptive to the institution that it merits limiting uh, expression. And, and, and as Rick has said, in a university context where uh, uh, open expression of ideas is highly valued because of the mission, it would take a lot for a university to say disruption outweighs the right to, to express in this area or, to, or to, to engage in continued discussion of ideas. Conceivably, there are instances in which that would occur. But the challenge is how, of course, faculty see that balancing test. It looks restrictive. And so people will, by anticipation, rein in what they say when they're fearful of, of, of controversy being stirred up as a result of their expression. But uh, I hope that has addressed your your question? We'll have to see what the policy says when they're done with it. Hi, my name is Daryl Lynn Dance. I'm a lecturer here in the English department. I just graduated from KU in December. Thank you. Um, I have a question about graduate teaching assistants. At KU, when I was a graduate teaching assistant, I was listed as a student. And I'm wondering how the graduate teaching assistants and perhaps the graduate research assistants are affected by this policy. And my second question deals with professors who use social media as part of their teaching. Um, I'm in the field of rhetoric and composition, and there are more professors in that field who use social media as a part of teaching, 
what happens if you have a student who says something disruptive? Does the professor become, does, does, would the professor be disciplined? Or, I'm just kind of curious how that would work. Well, I, th I think that uh, the social media policy, insofar as it applies to employment, would apply to the employment aspects of a graduate student's work. So if you're a TA, or if you're a research assistant, or working on a grant, or other kinds of activity, the policy would allow discipline in relation to that employment work. But it would not allow discipline of a student, um, or, or the removal from a program, for example, uh, uh, of a student. Now that might not that might be small consolation if if, if you need the employment in, in order to, to make your graduate uh, studies work. Um, as far as students are concerned, I don't think the policy speaks to students at all, and I don't believe that it places any obligation on faculty or staff to control the students or what they say. Um, on the other hand, you already have an obligation as a member of the faculty or as a teacher um, to maintain a classroom environment. Uh, and if you're, you're not doing your job of maintaining a classroom environment that's a good learning environment, that might be the basis for some sort of action independently under existing policies. And I guess that's an important general point for people to understand. Even without the social media policy, if you use social media in a way that violates policies, if you're harassing someone sexually or uh, engaged in race, a pattern of threats or stalking or something like that, or you plagiarize using social media, all of those kinds of misconduct could provide the basis for disciplinary action, not because of the social media policy or not because social media policy is involved, but because the uh, policies on um, academic integrity or sexual or racial harassment have been violated. Hi, Ed Russell, KU, thanks very much. I wonder if you could discuss the definition of social media. Um, when uh, the, the publicity uh, has tended to mention Facebook and Twitter, as though th that's the universe. Uh, the, then when I read the policy, I saw that it applied to all electronic media. Um, I wasn't sure, uh, well, virtually everything I do in my work is electronic. Even if I publish a book, it appears in an e-book form. If I write a journal article, it appears online as well as in print. Um, and then, so that's one thing about the definition, and I know that the the working group also seem to accept this definition of all electronic uh, media. So I'd be interested in your reflecting on that. But then secondly, I, I um, have had a hard time understanding the argument in the policy that social, that electronic social media are qualitatively and fundamentally different from all any other type of medium. Uh, the purpose of all media is social. It's to communicate ideas from one human being to another, which seems like the de interaction between two or more human beings seems to me the definition of social. So why are we carving out one particular area, um, and, and is this a step towards, I mean, in the end, since everything's online, it might not matter in a sense, but why, why are we even accepting this definition of, of social media? and? Uh, is that the best way to, to conceive of this issue? It's, it's a great question, and you would have, I think, 100% agreement from all the members of the work group uh, in most of the observations, in pr all the observations that you made. We basically agreed with you that there shouldn't be a separate sort of policy for social media. Uh, and the tenor of our original proposal uh, was to treat social media just like any other media and simply remind faculty and staff of the kinds of legal restrictions that already apply in with, uh, with any kind of expression. Uh, so you have no disagreement from us. And in fact, we wrestled with whether we could write a tight, narrow definition of social media that would solve the problem. 
that would protect much of the expression that faculty and staff are concerned about, and we couldn't figure out a way to do it because even if you write it very narrowly, the most narrow way that you possibly can, say Facebook or say Twitter, if this applies only to Twitter, these sorts of tools are still used in research and teaching uh, as, as well. So, so narrowing the definition didn't solve the problem. Our, our solution was to make the policy advisory rather than disciplinary. Once you're in the business of writing a disciplinary policy, then you face all the problems that you just raised. Uh, my, my general perception is that the regents thought social media was different because of the speed with which um, a, a, a poorly chosen phrase might be transmitted and the extent to which there can be an almost instantaneous flash fire around a controversial statement. So that would be, I mean, at least to try to understand what was motivating them to draft this policy, I would say that was why they thought social media had to be singled out for special treatment, was because the consequences or the, the degree of disruption that it might cause w presented new and, and, and different challenges than uh, other forms of uh, communication did. So my name is Jerry Michelson. I'm professor of Russian studies and currently a member of the faculty senate. I have just three uh, brief points to make. The first one has to do with the uh, interface in our discussions between lawyers and non-lawyers. Uh, Rick Levy knows that I'm being absolutely disingenuous and, and sincere when I say to about him on the floor of the Faculty Senate that I have the utmost respect for you because as long as you're around, Rick, we do indeed have our lawyer. We don't have to pay extra money for a lawyer <laughs> or a series of law, by we the coming. faculty and the <laughs> faculty and the staff and, and the students of this university. We have our lawyer. Thank heavens for that. Now, the second point in that same area there about this interface is I think that we have made tremendous progress in the right direction by starting from the launching pad of legal advice, uh, most of it from Rick Levy and therefore sage legal advice. Uh, but we have also moved beyond that stage uh, with the appointment of and the tremendous amount of work that was done during these past few months by the Joint Committee, co-chaired by Charles Epp, uh, who I did not even know personally until this all started, but for whom I have uh, tremendous respect. And I think his role and his voice is going to continue to be uh, one that we should all listen very, very, very carefully to in the future. Um, but in that same area there, I think, uh, uh, Richard DeGeorge, I'm going to quote you here, and if, I, if I'm misinterpreting some of the implications of what you said, if we could go at the other forum. Um, I'm sorry about that, but one the, the main point that Richard DeGeorge made when uh, there was a panel discussing the future university is that whatever shape, whatever shape or form or size it takes, that the um, decision making at universities has to be made, should be made at least by those who have the most knowledge and knowledge of the issues, knowledge of how a university functions in its laboratories, research, in its um, studies and classrooms and so on. Um, and so what I'm suggesting here is that movement that we've made from the uh, Levy stage to the EP stage of this without losing Levy, I hope, is one we have to continue moving towards. And since uh, the, the term university governance has been used a number of times here, several times by, by uh, Charles Epp himself, uh, this is what I'm aiming at, is that ultimately whatever what kind of a policy we have at this university for the use of social media has to be one that is determined by what we call joint governance not just as a phrase, empty or half full or whatever, but as a reality uh, so that it satisfi satisfies the expectations not only of the uh, uh, administration of the university, current administration, but also the, uh, uh, the majority or even vast majority of uh, the staff members, faculty members uh, in, our, in our university. Uh, the second 
uh, item that I want to make a brief comment or two. And there is a question here, I'm sorry, because uh, I'm going to ask some, anyone who wishes to respond to this. Um, I was present and listened very, very carefully to all of the discussion that took place on Friday between the president of KBUR, Fred Logan, and those of us who were there. I was among those many who expressed our gratitude to him for coming all the way from Topeka to Lawrence um, and spending all that time uh, in a room with, with us. Uh, and, and there were a number of staff people there, incidentally. We, they may have even outnumbered the faculty members, and that's for good reason, because as many people have mentioned already, uh, the, the amount of anxiety that has been caused by all this is much, much greater than is uh, the anxiety experienced by faculty members. Um, no, after having, that was a sincere expression of gratitude because we saw him face to face. He's a human being of a certain height and weight and so on and so on, manner of speaking. Now, before I made my remarks there, I expressed some apprehension about what seemed to me to be a fact, and that is that in the first hour or so of that interface, we did not seem to be speaking the same language. Uh, we were trying to bring to his attention the kinds of concerns which we have heard today, which we've heard a number of times in the faculty university summits and in the corridors of the university for the past almost entire academic year. And uh, the, the only response that we got to these is that, you know, in a sense, I'll put this in my pipe and smoke it. <laughs> um, you know, these are things I'm glad to be hearing, and, and the, it's important for me to hear them. But at no time did I have the impression that he was really, uh, in, uh, really prepared even to take any of those suggestions seriously. In fact, he repeated a number of times that the policy, the, the, those elements of the policy that we are the most concerned about and which cause the most apprehension on our part are not going to be removed. Now, we've heard some possible refinements of that uh, from Chuck Epp and from Richard Levy, and we certainly hope that those uh, um, softening measures or whatever we want to call them, uh, for example, in the area of um, uh, due process, if, if it actually says there that uh, the next Booth case will be adjudicated, not just in the uh, chancellor suite and in the uh, uh, provost's offices, but by down in the disciplines and the schools and so on, that's fine. Um, but uh, ultimately, I came to the conclusion, and I hope that I'm wrong about this, that the service that was done by that meeting with um, Fred Logan the other day was not very great to our cause. I'm not prepared to go as far as to say as that it was merely a publicity stunt on anybody's part, although that's perhaps the worst case scenario, as it could turn out to be just that. Now, the last point I want to make is a uh, warning of sorts, and I hope that, no, that I will not, uh, well, no one will take, reach the conclusion that I'm trying to foment violence here or, or invoke a revolution within the university. But I've been trying to get the, the university senate and, uh, and the faculty senate to think a little bit about, down the road a little bit now, as to what the consequences might be if this policy comes out as we all expect it to come out with those ugly provisions still in it. Now, it could be, as has happened many, many times in the past, that there will be an initial period of uh, sort of um, grudging acceptance or resignation, and it will be followed by apathy. And that's a very common response in universities to, you know, unfavorable news. Um, but I don't think that's going to happen in this case. Of course, if they accept the essence of the EP, EP, et cetera, report, that means that they will, in a sense, be doing a complete flip-flop here. Then we will be greatly relieved. Our respect for the Board of Regents as an, in, as an indispensable institution in our system will be greatly enhanced, and we will go on with our work in research and teaching and service and so on. Now, whether in that unlikely case, 
we will uh, turn out to be as Provost uh, Ritter has expressed a number of times as at least as a hope that we will become a model for the rest of the country. I rather doubt that. <laughs> Frankly speaking, we'd have to go a long ways from where we are right now to become a model for the, uh, for the country in that respect. But since we are pretty sure that we are not going to do this flip-flop, um, and if I'm correct, at this time it, it won't result in apathy, what could it result in? And even before the next booth-like case comes forward, there could be a much more active kind of reaction, not, on, not only on the part of faculty and staff, but even on students, because students are on the university senate, for example, and their amount of interest and alertness and, and motion on this subject has increased over the past several months, not only when they're in sight of us, but when they're alone in their uh, senates and so on. Um, and the rest of it uh, could go anywhere. Could go anywhere. Now, I'm not going to do any specification because I've spoken longer than I was supposed to, but I just want to say that um, I was a graduate student at the University of Wisconsin in Madison in the late, in the middle 1960s. And so you can probably see where I'm coming from, <laughs> literally and figuratively. That was during the Vietnam War, and that's when massive anti-war protests were taking place all over the country. And I'm proud to say that my alma mater was one of the leaders in that. Thank you. We have about three minutes to respond to that, and then we're taking a break. So, uh, uh, response from our speakers, or just go right into it? I'd like to say a few words. Well, that's the truth. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, after Chris says a few words, then we'll take a break. Take a break, drink some refreshments, and then come back about 3 30 because there's more. And then we do have to discuss Plan B. Right. So I'm Chris Sorensen. I'm from K-State. I'm also a product of the late 60s. I have a great deal of empathy from that point of view. And I think also that Vitter uh, was basically saying that we have a chance to uh, make a strong statement about Kansas because we will not be apathetic when th if this comes out the way we don't want it to come out. And I'm sure that uh, we'll hang together and we'll, we'll be models of civil disobedience. Uh, the other thing I wanted to bring up is to cite yet again Professor DeGeorge, a question that you brought up, I think you were saying, uh, uh, some 15 minutes ago, <laughs> was, was the concept that uh, when the pol new policy comes out, if it's not to our liking, we will still have some latitude at the institutions as how to, pr to interpret that. And if indeed we have shared governance and we've got uh, responsive provosts and presidents, then those provosts and presidents could form their own local campus committees that would determine how we deal with this uh, law, and we could emasculate the damn thing, and they could go ahead and be happy that they've studied their case law and cited it all properly, but we'll run our universities the way we want. Am I correct in this point of view? Now, I'd still like to fight the good fight. Don't get me wrong. I don't want to turn my back on a problem. I am a product of the late 60s, after all. Just a simple response to that. It's, it's pretty clear that the policy gives authority to the universities, but they may need not use it in all the ways that the authority uh, provides. And so that is uh, to, to, to discipline. It also, uh, there's a, as, as Fred Logan said in our meeting last Wednesday, the, the universities have in inherent authority to write their own rules and regulations to interpret board policy. And I was simply suggesting, and I think others have as well, that we use that authority in ways that are constructive uh, for the universities. Well, thank you. Thanks to the presenters for lending their expertise. Thanks to all of you for your questions. And now it is time for a coffee break.